a lot of bodybuilders worry about doing aerobics be because they believe that doing aerobics is going to cost them muscle mass. In other words, if they do aerobics, they're going to lose muscle. This has been told to me by dozens of bodybuilders over the years. And in fact, there have been actually been some studies that indicate there's some truth to that, meaning that if you do aerobics after a workout, you can lose some muscle. However, more recent studies have indicated that just that depends on the situation. You're more likely to lose muscle when you do aerobics uh, after a, uh, a workout session involving weights if you're already very low in body fat, don't have much body fat to lose, and you're on, let's say, a zero or extremely low carbohydrate diet. If you do an extensive amount of aerobics under those conditions, there's a good chance you will lose some muscle. Uh, you know, I, I've talked about ways of preserving muscle in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. Under that particular condition, meaning low body fat and uh, low, low, uh, you know, a low carbohydrate diet, you might want to supplement, uh, let's say, maybe five or eight grams of branched chain amino acids right before, uh, let's say about it, maybe uh, 45 minutes before you do aerobics, the branched chain amino acids will spare any muscle that might be lost doing the aerobics. But generally speaking, modern amounts of uh, conventional aerobics, uh, which involves less than one hour or 60 minutes, almost never results in, in muscle mass loss. It just doesn't happen. That's more of a myth than anything else. It all depends on how long you do it. If you go over an hour with an aerobic session, then you're starting to tip the scales towards muscle mass loss, especially if you do it like some people, uh, I don't see it very often anymore. Some people have done two, uh, two straight hours of aerobics. Uh, if you're already lean and you do that, you probably are going to lose some muscle. But again, one hour less, there is very little to no muscle loss. Uh, now, there is a form of aerobics that, you know, if you're worried about losing muscle, it's actually tailor-made for you. And uh, many let's say, uh, exercise physiologists and uh, exercise experts uh, actually say that this particular form of aerobics is superior to conventional aerobics. Now, what is conventional aerobics, I should say, is steady state aerobics, where you, let's say you get on a treadmill or a rowing machine or elliptical machine, and you do, let's say, 30 minutes at a, at a uh, steady heart rate. You know, you don't alternate the intensity. It's one level of intensity throughout the whole exercise session. That's conventional aerobics. The other type of aerobics is known as interval training. I've written extensively about interval training in my Applied Metabolics newsletter, including a lot of the health effects. I'm not going to go into a lot of the health effects here, but uh, subscribers to my uh, newsletter can, can, can refer to those articles just by doing a search. On the Applied Metabolic site, just uh, enter the term interval training in the search box. It'll take you to the articles where I discussed various aspects of interval training. And I will continue, by the way, to update what I have in my newsletter. As new research emerges, I will update all the information about interval training. But right now, I want to give you a little overview of why interval training might be the best form of training for you. Now, where did interval training come from? Uh, interval training actually is a, uh, you can say it's a, uh, a byproduct of a training that was developed in the 1930s by a Swedish scientist. It was called Fartlek, and nothing to do with farts. Uh, Fartlek translates into speed play, and the reason why it was called speed play is it, it usually involved fairly long distance running over various terrain, you know, hills and valleys and, you know, through the forest and all that stuff. It was like basically outdoor running, but the, the trick is, uh, is that you would alternate, like you'd, you'd sprint for, for a couple of minutes at, at high speed, maximum exercise, and that you'd sprint whenever whenever you felt like it. It, was, it wasn't structured. And then you would slow down the running to, let's say, a jog. And then, you know, maybe up the road you'd sprint around again. You know, this was called fartlek training. And it was the original form of uh, inter internet training. And uh, there was a famous athlete called Pavo Nermi who was like a phenomenal runner. He was like like way ahead of the pack. This guy, I don't even remember how many Olympic gold medals he run. He, he won, but he also set oh, God knows how many world records. Uh, he was called the Flying Finn, and he was active in the 1920s and 1930s. And the significance is that Nurmi was the first world-class athlete to employ fartlek training, and he considered it responsible for his absolutely phenomenal running success. Interval training is based, is based on heart rate. Uh, 
you, you use the high intensity portions of interval training to get your heart rate up to levels of about maybe 80% of maximum or higher. And so this is alternated with lower levels of exercise intensity that brings the heart rate down to about 60% of maximum. Uh, later on in this video, I'll give you a couple of sample uh, ways to use various forms of interval training so you get a clearer picture of what I'm talking about. The adaptation of high-intensity interval training is thought to be responsible for the steady breaking of world records in middle and long-distance running in recent years, including the marathon. If you follow track, you'll notice that the records kind of creep up slowly. And the reason for this is generally attributed to the inclusion of interval training along with skill training. In other words, uh, obviously marathon runners have to include long-distance running as part of their training. You know, they'll run, let's say, uh, they'll do what they call a hard and easy workout. One day, you know, a marathon is 26 miles, 385 yards. So a typical marathon workout would be maybe one day they'll do 15 miles. Next day they'll do 10 miles. And then the third or fourth day they might go up to uh, maybe 18 miles. They very rarely do the full 26 miles. But this alternating of hard easy makes it easier for them to recover between workouts and also tends to prevent injuries. Um, I worked with a lot of professional boxers in the 90s, and uh, when uh, me and the rest of the team that trained these boxers, I handled the nutrition part, but I was also involved in the training too. Uh, a lot, of, most of these boxers, when we first began working with them, uh, they use what you know they, they used to like just run. They would just do regular conventional aerobics. They do road work. You know, they'd get up early in the morning. They'd run as much as 10 miles, but it was at a steady state. And I pointed out to some of the boxers, I said, wait a minute, when you go in the ring, it's, uh, what is it, three minutes of fighting or something like that? I said, you don't run around the ring. I said, you hit and you rest, you hit and rest, and you defend yourself, then you sit in the corner. I said, think about it. That's basically interval training. So uh, I, I convinced these boxers to do interval training, three minutes hard, you know, uh, with uh, maybe one or two minutes easy, because it mimicked the effect of actual boxing in the ring. Every single one of these boxers had showed tremendous improvements in endurance by employing this technique. So that's just one example of sports, uh, how it can be employed in sports. High intensity tra uh, interval training, also known as HIT, H-I-T-T, -T, is ideal for bodybuilders who fear losing muscle mass by doing conventional aerobic training. And the reason for this is that HIT workouts are much shorter than conventional aerobic training. But they provide the same or better benefits in terms of health improvements and fat oxidation in far less time. For example, uh, a 20-minute, uh, a, a science studies have shown a 20-minute HIT session, high interval training session, equals, in terms of benefits, 90 minutes of con conventional aerobics. Think about that. 20 minutes of, of HIT equals 90 minutes of conventional aerobics. The reason for this is that while conventional aerobics works mainly the type 1 or slow twitch fibers, also known as endurance fibers, HIT works both the slow twitch and type 2 fast twitch fibers. The type 2 fast uh, the type 2 or fast twitch fibers are the fibers most amenable to muscle growth. And when you do HIT, you're training both types of fibers, which makes uh, HIT like a combination of aerobic and an anaerobic exercise. Weight training is anaerobic exercise. It works mostly the type 2 fast twitch, whereas the conventional aerobics work mostly the type 1 or slow twitch fibers. Studies show that HIT improves VO2 max or maximum oxygen intake more efficiently compared to conventional uh, aerobics training. What this means is greater exercise endurance. In other words, if you, do, uh, if you, if you employ HIT training in your workouts, your, your endurance will go up, your capacity to utilize oxygen will go up, which means that you can train harder and faster with less fatigue. Now, of course, if you add something like beet juice to, uh, to the mix, you have a tremendous effect, but that's another topic. Of uh, HIT also offers advantages in greater oxidative enzyme capacity in muscle. What does that mean? The oxidative enzymes mean a greater capacity to burn or oxidize body fat. So you, can, you lose more body fat when you do... Uh, HIT or HIT tra HITT or HIT training with far less exercise time. Uh, HIT pr uh, promotes the release of, of a substance called B PGC1. PGC1 forces the development of new mitochondrian cells. What is mitochondria? Mitochondria are, are, are cigar-shaped organelles found in cells 
They are the site of both fat oxidation or burning and energy production as ATP. The more mitochondria you have in your muscle, the greater the fat burning capacity, the greater your endurance, and the greater your capacity to build muscle. So that's an, a tremendous feature of uh, HITT or HIT training. Uh, so the fact that HIT uses both slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers means a also a greater use of muscle glycogen during exercise. Muscle glycogen is stored carbohydrate muscle. It's the primary fuel for anaerobic exercise or uh, or that or, or weight such as weight training. Uh, you know the the uh, normal aerobics involves usually a, a mixture of uh, 50 percent fat after 30 minutes. 50% glucose and 50% uh, um, fat after about 30 minutes. However, high intensity interval training taps right into muscle glycogen. And this results in a greater uptake of glucose after exercise and explains why some studies show that a combination of high intensity interval training and a low, carbo low carbohydrate diet can actually prevent the onset of type 2 diabetes. Indeed, Blood glucose levels decrease for 24 hours following a HIT session, which ameliorates insulin insensitivity, which is the precursor to type 2 diabetes. HITT can also increase the activity of GLUT4, which is the primary glucose carrier in muscle after only two weeks of training. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. And now, you, now that you understand some of the advantages of uh, high-intensity interval training, meaning far less time in the gym, uh, you know, the only disadvantage I can tell you is that it's not its not really, a, I wouldn't call it a fun way to exercise. You can't mess around. You can't, like, read books. And, you know, you can't, like, you know, it's, it's, it involves work. you got to be really working with a high intensity. But, you know, the, the payoff is great. Let me give you an example of a couple of uh, high intensity training regimes. The first one is probably the most intense of all. It's called Tabata training. It's named after a Japanese researcher who developed it. I don't recommend this for most people. It's basically for, uh, you know, I'd say almost like elite athletes, endurance athletes, uh, definitely not for people that haven't exercised before. It's way too intense because it involves doing uh, your aerobics for 20 seconds at a, at a, a, a heart rate involving 170% of VO2 max. That means you're all out 100%. I mean, it's murderous. You follow this with 10 seconds of rest using and, and, uh, at a very low. When I say rest, I mean you, you bring the, the intensity, the exercise intensity down very low, almost to, the, to where you're walking. This is repeated. This alternation of high and low intensity is repeated eight times, and the total workout time is only eight minutes. That's it, eight minutes. Believe, and that, believe me, you can't do this for more than eight minutes. Another type of um, typical hit section, hit workout, it's called the Wingate high intensity. The Wingate. This is often used in exercise science studies uh, as a way of measuring anaerobic endurance, that type of thing. It usually involves uh, using a stationary cycle, what they call an ergo, uh, cycling ergometer. Uh, and this type of workout it involves 30 seconds of all-out training under constant resistance, followed by four minutes of low-intensity training, also, also called active recovery. This is repeated four to six times. And usually involves, a, like I say, involves a stationary cycle. The workout lasts 18 to 27 minutes. Again, very low workout time because of the high intensity. Now, the conventional HIIT workout, this is the one that's usually used by most people, involves 60 seconds uh, at 90% of maximum heart rate, followed by 60 seconds of lower intensity exercise, where you go much slower and bring your heart rate down. This is repeated 10 times for a total workout time of 20 minutes. And as I said, this workout equals, as far as the, the benefits and the health effects, equals 90 minutes of con conventional aerobics. Uh, it can be done, uh, th this type of, uh, of a conventional high-intensity interval training. It can be, you can use a stationary cycle, a treadmill, a, uh, you know, a elliptical machine. You can even do it with weights if you wanted to. But, uh, you know, I recommend the uh, aerobics machines a little bit better. Studies show that combining high-intensity training, high-intensity interval training with weight training not only doesn't lead to muscle mass loss, losses, but actually promotes additional muscle gains over weight training alone. A recent, and again, the reason for this is because high-intensity interval training involves the type 2 slow-twitch muscle fibers. So it's an additive effect to weight training rather than a negative effect. 
A recent study confirmed that doing high-intensity interval training cycling following a weight workout did not lead to any loss of muscle mass whatsoever. For bodybuilders, it's probably best to do high-intensity interval training using a treadmill, elliptical machine, or, uh, or a uh, stationary cycle rather than running. For some reason, doing high-intensity high running, uh, especially, let's say, after a leg workout, it, d it does tend to kind of a, uh, blunt strength gains. For some reason, this only occurs with running. It doesn't occur with the exercise machine. So, And also, the running is a little hard on your knees anyway, especially if you're over 150 pounds. So I don't recommend using uh, high-intensity interval training uh, running as a means of exercise for bodybuilders. So that's about it. Uh, in my next video, I'm going to talk about nutritional support for interval, high intensity interval training. In other words, uh, what's the best way to eat? And are there certain supplements that'll make high intensity interval training more efficient and even easier to do? That'll be my next video. In the meantime, if you want the best information available anywhere, subscribe today to my Applied Metabolics newsletter, www.appliedmetabolics.com. Each month, and then 40 to 50 pages, I cover nutrition, supplements, the best techniques and most efficient techniques to lose body fat, including in interval training, uh, supplements, hormonal manipulation, ergogenic aids, exercise sets, all of this every month in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. It's like getting uh, a monthly ebook every month, intensive research, very in depth. It's not for the, uh, uh, the, uh, let's say the, 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 sh the person who has a very short attention span uh, because it's extremely in-depth. Uh, you know, if you can't handle a, a, vi a video like this, which lasts like 17 minutes, then honestly, I, I don't think Applied Metabolics is for you. It's for people that want to educate themselves, want to learn things, and want to read information that's not available elsewhere, that is practical and useful, something they could use today to improve their exercise, improve their body composition, and improve their health. Again, www.appliedmetabolics.com. No better source of information anywhere. Uh, it contains my 55 years of constant study and personal experience in every issue. You won't find that anywhere, I guarantee you. If you want to have the best friend you'll ever find, get yourself, go to, your, go to a shelter, adopt a dog, any dog, any breed, whatever you like. They're the best, oh man, they're the most loyal creatures. I just love dogs. They're the most, uh, I only have one dog now, my, 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 my dog Chip, as I said in a previous video, he passed away because of cancer on October 11th. Uh, I miss him dearly. I only have my one dog now, Bruno, who's very quiet. You don't you don't even hear him in these videos. But the odds are I probably will get another dog pretty soon, or at least foster dogs, because I want to do everything I can to save dogs, because I think they're like uh, God's gift to man. I, I think of them that highly. Anyway, take care.